Sure, it's great to be with all of you. Thank you for your enthusiasm, your participation. And I hope you have fun as I uh, share. If not, just snore loudly to give me the feedback I need about how well I'm doing. So the point of my presentation is that if we want to really understand the Book of Mormon well, we need to understand covenants that show up in the, book, in the Bible. And to understand the Bible, there's two covenantal mountains that uh, show up in the Bible and influence the production of different biblical scriptures and the stories and prophecies that we find therein. First, we have Mount Zion, uh, Jerusalem, where the temple is, the Temple of Solomon, as well as the base of the Davidic kingship. The other mountain is Mount Sinai, where Moses encountered God and received the law of Moses. So these two mountains are crucial for understanding the Bible, and I want to test to see how the covenants that show up at these mountains, the covenant at Mount Sinai and the covenant at Mount Zion, how and if they show up in the Book of Mormon and what that might suggest for better understanding the Book of Mormon. So first, just let me point out that in the Bible, scholars have determined that the covenant that shows up at Zion influences the production of the books that I've listed here on the left. Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, Hosea, Jeremiah, and the wisdom literature, which includes Proverbs. And on the other side, the Mount Zion covenant seems to be the bedrock for other books in the Bible. First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and portions of Isaiah and Psalms, which is, uh, will be interesting for our discussion for the Book of Mormon. Now let me begin with um, the Mount Zion covenant. Scholars call the covenant associated with Mount Zion in the Bible, Zion theology. And the things I'm talking about covenant-wise, um, these are discoveries that scholars have made in the last 50 to 80 or 90 years. I just want you to keep that in your mind that this was not, these covenant types were not understood in the 1820s and 1830s. There are three main things about Zion theology. The first point is the eternal Davidic dynasty, that David and his descendants will always be on the throne of Israel. The second point is that God has chosen Zion, this is known as Jerusalem, as his earthly abode, and the temple is the physical manifestation of God's presence. As long as a temple stood, God's glory was there. And God is an unsaleable divine warrior. He'll protect Zion. Since he's the God of creation, there's nothing in the natural order that can overcome God. And if you imagine if how the Israelites saw this, if God is seen to be in his heavenly, seen in, to be in the temple, then Jerusalem and its people would always be protected. That's the core of Zion theology. Let me talk about each of these three uh, principles in turn. Let me just talk briefly about the eternal Davidic dynasty of David. And this covenant that God makes with David and his descendants shows up in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 8 through 16. Let me just read some of this to you, what God shares with David through the prophet Nathan. And God says to David, I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And he goes on and says, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And let me just stop for a minute. David actually had built himself a palace, a house, realized he didn't have any more enemies to fight, and said, why is it that I live in a house of cedar and God still dwells in a tent? At this point, the Ark of the Covenant still dwelt in the tabernacle and yet had not yet had a final physical resting place. And so David said, I'm going to build God a house. And what's interesting is God says, no, actually, I'm going to build you a house. And the Hebrew word there can mean both like a physical structure, but David already has one, or a dynasty. So that's what God's saying is that um, he will make thee a house, David, and when thy days be fulfilled that thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, 
I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So this is where we get a core essence of Zion theology that God has chosen the Davidic dynasty to last forever and that God will be their father and each king will be served as a representative son of God. So let's talk just briefly about God choosing Zion or Jerusalem as his earthly abode. And let me just uh, share a couple of stories about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I got special permission from a warehouse in government control to get this picture. <laughs> and for a small fee, I will give you the GPS coordinates. So those who accepted Zion theology believe that God's presence permanently chose to reside in Jerusalem at his temple. And the belief was that the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the law of Moses... And we'll actually talk in a minute about how that's a different covenant that's actually in this spot. But for those who believe in Zion theology, they saw this as the throne of God, that his divine presence would sit here. Now, in Israelite times, before uh, Solomon built the temple, the ark was in the tabernacle. And it was a place, actually, where people felt like they had to be very careful in the presence of God. Um, we notice, for example, that uh, when God's presence came to the Ark of the Covenant and his glory filled the tabernacle, the people actually, uh, the Israelites, were a bit afraid to go to the tabernacle. They were worried about what might happen to them. Um, later we have the story of the Israelites brought the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle because, well, God's a divine warrior. If we bring his presence into battle, we'll win. And it's kind of strange the Israelites lose the battle, and the Ark of the Covenant falls into the hands of the Israelite enemies, the Philistines. And then there's all these really hilarious stories in the Bible about how the Philistines put this sacred object into their temple dedicated to their god Dagon, or Dagon. And one day they come in, and their statue of their god has fallen over. It looks like he's bowing down to God, Elohim. So they put their statue back up, and the next day the arms are chopped off. The Philistines re realize the power of God is with this object. We better not touch this thing. So they put it on a cart, um, sent it off back to Israel without a driver, and the oxen kind of make their way into, back to Israel. And because even the Philistines realized that they did not want to mess with the power of God. So these are just some of the stories that the Israelites remembered and told to uh, encourage each other to remember God's presence is here, his, his presence is powerful, and you can trust in it. Now, these ideas actually go back to the idea of creation, that God is this great creator where there's chaos that's enveloped the world. And he's the one who can separate all the chaos, the light from dark, um, water from earth. And in the ancient times, he was seen to be this conqueror of the divine or the semi-divine sea monsters. And all these ideas were floating around among the Israelites, and they saw that God had all power over his creation. So again, just in summary, the three core ideas of this covenant of Zion theology, first of all, is unconditional. God would always back it up according to 2 Samuel chapter 7, that it was based on a Davidic dynasty about God's presence being in Jerusalem and that God as a divine warrior would always protect Jerusalem. And let me just share just briefly um, a bit more about this, uh, this divine warrior. Let me share with you some of the psalms that were sung at the temple to glorify God and to talk about these qualities. This is uh, Psalm 93. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. Now I want you to think about kind of the military or the strength symbolism that we see here about his divine warrior attributes. He has established the world. It never shall be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. Remember, this is both the floods at creation, also the floods at the time of Noah. Um, the floods lift up their roaring, more majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. So as a divine warrior, God's attributes envelop Mount Zion. 
which is Jerusalem. And it's equated with the temple in Jerusalem as the geographical theophany of God's invincible supremacy. Let me just read just one more passage about how this strength and power that God had transferred to Jerusalem and how the people who lived in Jerusalem felt safety if they could see the temple, they knew God's presence was there, they'd be protected. This is Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, that's Jerusalem, his holy mountain, the temple, beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king, with its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled, they came on together. So this is all the enemy kings against uh, the enemies of Israel. As soon as they saw it, the city of Zion, Jerusalem, these enemy kings were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Walk about Zion, go about it, count its towers, consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels, you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. So you can see the, feel the power and the strength, the faithfulness the Israelites um, expressed about God's divine warrior attributes and how that provided protection from them, for them against all their enemies. Let me share a quick story about how the Israelites believed this theology of Zion theology was fully confirmed. Uh, you might remember around 701 BC, the Assyrians had come to conquer Jerusalem. They'd already conquered like 46 other Judean uh, towns, and now they have surrounded Jerusalem. Hezekiah is the king. Isaiah is the prophet. And Hezekiah is a bit distraught about what should be done. And he goes to Isaiah and says, what shall we do? And it turns out Isaiah prays to God. And God tells Isaiah, I will preserve Jerusalem for my sake and for the sake of my servant David, which is back to Zion theology. There was this unconditional covenant God is going to protect the city. And then we get this amazing story of 185,000 Assyrians waking up the next morning, they're all dead. They're all dead men. And this happens probably only about 80 years before the time of Lehi, 100 years before um, Nephi and his party leave Jerusalem. So this would have been fresh in the minds of the people of Jerusalem in the time of Lehi and Nephi, when the Babylonians now are threatening to attack Jerusalem. You start to get a sense for the safety and maybe how some of the Israelites um, depended too much on this covenant and their sense of unconditionality, unconditionality about it to uh, perhaps they sh should have been repenting when they didn't. Zion theology actually was not accepted by all people in the biblical world. Uh, Jeremiah was one of the main criticizers of this idea. He believed that it kept people from being uh, morally responsible for their own lives. And if we read in Jeremiah 28, let me share with you. Now, the, now this is about 100 years after Hezekiah and Isaiah. The Babylonians are now threatening the city. And Jeremiah is telling the people, repent, and you need to figure out how to work with the Babylonians. Maybe, maybe Many of the people in Jerusalem are saying, this is God's city. He's the divine king. We don't need to make any deals with the Babylonians. There's nothing that we need to do. God will protect the city. All is well in Zion. Here's what Jeremiah says. I, Jeremiah, spoke to King Zedekiah of Judah in the same way. Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now think about this. If you're somebody in, his, in Jerusalem who believes that, God, that there's the temple, God's presence is there, he's the divine warrior, why would I go make a deal with a human king, an enemy king, when my eternal king's on the throne? So this is actually a, a pretty significant sign of um, a, a religious apostasy and political treason. So Jeremiah is actually treading on um, hot coals, treading in hot water. And here's what he says. Jeremiah says, you should serve the king of Babylon and his people and live. Why should you and your people die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence? As the Lord has spoken concerning any nation, they will not serve the king of Babylon. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are telling you not to serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. So there were different prophets, and some were saying, um, 
just trust in Zion, trust in the temple, because the temple's there, that means you're all safe. And Jeremiah was like, no, you're not safe. You haven't repented, and if you don't repent and make a deal with the Babylonians, you're all going to be destroyed. So Jeremiah told the people, do not trust in the physical presence of the temple alone. Okay, that, that Zion theology covenant is not enough to save you. You have to be doing more. As we know, Jeremiah got thrown in prison. He was nearly executed about this uh, for his preaching. And you start to get a sense of possibly Lehi may have been sharing a very similar message, which may have been the reason why people wanted to kill him, because he was not preaching Zion theology. And let me give you a summary then. Zion theology simply preached all is well in Zion. You don't get a sense that you need to repent, that you need to serve the poor, that you need to not simply be um, after filthy lucre. But this is the substance of how Zion theology got practiced by the uh, people in Jerusalem at the time of Nephi, Lehi, and Jeremiah. Okay, let me transition to the other mountain covenant that shows up in the Bible. We've seen the unconditional covenant situated at Mount Zion. Let's now move to the Mount Sinai. So this covenant is conditional. The promises associated with this covenant are based on fidelity by the people who receive the covenant from God. And there's a whole set of expectations and stipulations that God expects people of this covenant to live by. And let me talk about some of the core features or uh, relationships we see with this covenant. First, Moses is seen as kind of like the ideal human, somebody to aspire to follow or somebody to aspire to be like. And as you think about the Book of Mormon, I want you to think about how much do people aspire to be like Moses versus aspiring to be like uh, David. Um, this covenant seems to be most associated with the northern ten tribes of Israel, and it follows a conditional format. Um, the technical term is a suzerain-vassal treaty. Suzerain is a great king. A vassal is a lesser individual who will receive protection, peace, and prosperity if they have their loyalty attached to the great king, the suzerain. It's interesting, in the conditional covenant at Mount Sinai, God is the king, and human kings, if there are to be any, are simply meant to be the chief scriptorian. If you actually look at what the uh, book of Deuteronomy says about this. And we'll get to that in a minute. And we also seem, from many years of scholarship, this covenant seems to be associated with the ancient scribal class who also produced wisdom literature. So let's take a look at this covenant, its features, and then we'll tie it all together with the Zion covenant and see what does this mean for the Book of Mormon. Since the Book of Mormon comes out of an ancient Israelite context, which of these covenants, both, none, or one or the other, most seems to be a part of the Book of Mormon, and what might that suggest about our understanding of the Book of Mormon? Let's just talk a bit about Moses as the ideal figure. Just at a superficial level, you have some really interesting connections, even in the first chapter of Nephi, that Lehi goes out and he has a pillar of fire from the Lord, stands in front of him and gives him revelation. This is very much like what happened to Moses. He sees a burning bush, and later there's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, that guides Moses and the Israelites. And so Lehi here is described and has experiences very much like a prophet like Moses. Let's even take Nephi. When Nephi is going to confront this very difficult character, Laban, in the Book of Mormon, and he's trying to convince his brothers, Laman and Lemuel particularly, to have faith, does Nephi call upon the memory of David and Goliath? or other great stories from David's conquests, he doesn't touch David at all. He actually goes back to Moses. He says, let us be strong like Moses, who led the people through the waters on dry ground. If God can conquer the waters of creation, the waters of the Red Sea, and save our ancestors, why can't he help us get the place from Laban? Very powerful story. So even Nephi is narrating and letting his life be very much influenced by the character of Moses. Let's move to this next principle, the, the idea that this covenant seems to have been uh, very well known in the northern kingdom of Israel. I want to point out on the map that um, we had a separation of Israel during the time of uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, 
And the 12 tribes were broken into two kingdoms. You have the northern 10 tribes and then the southern tribes. The southern tribes were primarily Judah and a portion of Benjamin. The, t- uh, the northern tribes are above that. And what do we know about uh, Lehi's ancestry? That he descends from Manasseh, which is very interesting that Lehi comes from the north. He's living in Jerusalem, but the Zion theology, which is all about Jerusalem, apparently is not the theological perspective that Lehi himself buys into. He seems to buy into the covenant that God made with Moses and his people at Mount Sinai that was uh, very much promoted in the northern kingdom. Zion theology was not an idea that the ten northern tribes spent a lot of time with. Let me talk about the features of the conditional covenant. There are six core features. There's lots of ancient texts from the ancient world that talk about these features. And very interestingly, they show up um, throughout the Book of Mormon. Let me walk through them. Um, In this covenant, there are six features of the covenant. First, there's an introduction where the great king or God will introduce himself and remind people of the great deeds that he has done for the people. And that historical review, if we actually go to Exodus chapter 20, God actually tells the people, I bore you on eagle's wings, I took you up out of Egypt. So he's reviewing for them the great deeds of love that he's done for them, and therefore they should be ready to give their covenant fidelity to him. And what do they need to do to prove their faithfulness? It's stip- there's a number of stipulations. And let me actually just bring this up real quick. It's in Exodus chapter 20. And I'm going to read some of these, and you might be familiar with them from other settings in your life. Well, now my uh, scriptures are updating. I don't think Nephi ever dealt with that. <laughs> Hopefully it's truer now that I have this update. All right. Exodus 20. Let's listen to what God says. He's like, okay, I'm the great king, the great suzerain. I'm introducing myself. I'm going to review all the great things I've done for you. I've I've saved you out of Egyptian bondage. Now here's what I expect you to do to demonstrate your fidelity to me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down to any other gods. I show mercy unto many. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. What are these? The Ten Commandments. What we often miss is the Ten Commandments are the middle portion of a six-part covenant conditional treaty. And... Those are the stipulation God wants us as his vassals to do to demonstrate total fidelity to him. And I might point out that the Jews, for the most part, understood this. And they wanted to very particularly demonstrate their love to God. Well, if you don't know all the stipulations, can you fully show your love to God? The reasoning was no. And that's why the Pharisees were so particular to try to document every single little commandment. Now, we call them Pharisaical. The original intent for them is they wanted to demonstrate full love and fidelity to God. And if you don't know what all the commandments are, you can't do it. So that's kind of the reasoning of what happened why the Pharisees got slightly off track. The intention was good. Okay. After the covenant is made, God has it written down, and those are the tablets that Moses got from the mount. And then there's a number of witnesses that get listed. And in this case, it's God and all of his divine attendants And all the people, they're all witnesses that they understand the obligations of fidelity, that they have to live these stipulations. Otherwise, they won't get the promised blessings, which are peace and prosperity in the land. If they live the commandments, peace and prosperity. If they don't, there's a whole bunch of curses and blessings that get listed. In fact, if you go into, like, say, Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, those two chapters are dedicated to listing out all the promises and curses that happen if people do not keep the Mosaic conditional covenant. Let me point out just uh, one example of how this conditional covenant shows up in the Book of Mormon and it follows the model. So when King Benjamin gives his great last speech, 
He introduces himself. He gives a historical review of all the great things that he's done for the people, that he's tried to serve them, to bring them peace and prosperity. And because of that, they're going to owe him allegiance. But notice he says, really, if I've done anything for you, really, it's your great God. So even Benjamin recognizes, even though the people are vassals to him, that Benjamin himself is a vassal to our great God, and that the people need to owe their total allegiance to him. And if you go into chapter 4 of King Benjamin's speech in Mosiah, there's all these do's and don'ts. In fact, he finally gets to a point where he doesn't want to stop. He wants to stop listing things. He's like, look, I can't tell you all the ways that you can commit sin. Just remember, if you don't watch your words, your deeds, things will not go well for you. So all of this is to say that the stipulations are laid out again for the people of Nephi, that they can recommit themselves to this conditional covenant, that they can express their fidelity to God by keeping the commandments, and therefore they'll be able to preserve the peace and prosperity of the land. Um, we notice there's also witnesses that show up in King Benjamin's speech. The people feel the spirit. They all fall down. They're all willing to uh, take upon themselves the name of Christ. And later, this uh, gets all recorded. Now, we actually don't know where it got put. There isn't a reference in the text. But our assumption would be that they would have put it in a sacred place, likely the temple. So what's the summary of this covenant? You've all heard the phrase in the Book of Mormon, if you keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. And I mean to write an academic article about this. I happen to have a busy day job, and I haven't gotten to it. But it dawned on me, the book of Deuteronomy is a retelling of the entire conditional covenant, the Mosaic Law. Now, if you're a scripture writer and you want somebody to remember the entire book of Deuteronomy, do you repeat the whole book of Deuteronomy, or do you simply summarize it? And that summary statement, which shows up everywhere in the Book of Mormon, is the summary statement of the Sinai covenant to Moses, well, from God to Moses and all the people. If you shall keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. Remember what the other covenant was, all is well in Zion. Very different perspectives. Okay, let's talk about um, the last two features of the conditional covenant. That God is a king, and the human is supposed to be the chief scriptorian. The Book of Mormon writers, for the most part, well, they always understood. The, the people in the Book of Mormon did not always understand who the right king was supposed to be. Listen to what Jacob says in 2 Nephi 10. He's quoting from God. God says, I, the Lord, the king of heaven, will be their king. Notice that the people wanted Nephi to be a king. He refused the title because he knew who the real king was. This actually also shows up in the Bible. After the Israelites conquered the land of Israel and had the judges, Eventually, they got sick of judges, and they wanted a human king. And Samuel said, you have a king. It's God. Like, nope, we want a human king. So Samuel goes back to tell God, look, your people don't want you as king. So 1 Samuel chapter 8. But the, the thing displeased Samuel when the people said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, Samuel, but they rejected me, that I should not rule over them. Now notice this shows up in the area of the Bible that seems to be most influenced by the Mosaic Law conditional covenant and not the Zion covenant of unconditionality of God's divine presence in Jerusalem. And God goes on, According to all the works which the Israelites have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and have served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Basically, the people have rejected me. I gave them the list of stipulations. They're not doing it. They cannot expect to have peace and prosperity if they're not keeping the commandments. So let them have a human king. Um, it turns out there's only seven verses in the entire Bible that together give us a view of what God expects of a human king. And I'm just going to give you a summary. God doesn't want the king to have a lot of horses. Don't raise a military. Don't return the people to Egypt. I interpret this to mean don't take them back into apostasy. Don't acquire many wives. Don't seek after silver and gold. Most politicians do this stuff. <laughs> and God's like, don't do these things, okay? But if you are the king or the leader, I want you to do this. Get a copy of the scriptures. Read it every day. Teach it to people. Don't lift yourself up above brethren. Have you ever known a leader to do the bottom four items? Okay, maybe some church leaders, right? Well, not some, but all. <laughs> What's interesting is if you compare this list that shows up in Deuteronomy chapter 17 to how Nephi serves as a leader, 
He doesn't acquire a lot of horses. He doesn't return the people to Egypt. He doesn't seek after a lot of wives. doesn't seek after silver and gold. Actually, he does find that stuff, but for the purpose of building a temple, not to ingratiate himself with lots of money. Benjamin, he fulfills all the obligations, exactly as expect. Mosiah II, guess who's the perfect counterweight to this? King Noah. He does everything he's not supposed to do to the point that he doesn't even know the scriptures. He has the priests fighting with Abinadi. Noah seems to be completely ignorant about the scriptures. He's supposed to be the scripture expert. Doesn't do it. I hope you can see the power that the Mosaic Covenant has in the Book of Mormon for shaping the theology and the culture that Nephi brought to the New World. Um, let me just share a few more things about this, um, just briefly. The, this covenant is often connected to the ancient scribal class and to books like the Book of Proverbs. And if you look carefully, um, we have this stunning feature about Nephi that most of us never think about. He's literate, and he can write. Now, in the ancient world, some estimates are that only about 10% of the population was literate. Why would you need to be literate? To farm? Most people don't need literacy. So the fact that Nephi can write meant that he had to be trained in a scribal school. And as we study ancient scribal schools, we see a lot of connections to the ancient wisdom tradition. And if you look at the major themes of the ancient wisdom tradition, Nephi fits them very well. Even to the point that he talks about how he is making a record. Let me share with you what the book of Proverbs begins with. Uh, chapter 2, actually. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. I see Nephi as somebody who embodies this ancient wisdom perspective of listening to the divine words of God and recording them, listening to his own wise father, recording them, and becoming a scripture expert and passing it on for future generations. Truly he is a wise man. And I'll say quickly as an aside, there's a really fascinating story early in the Book of Mormon where Nephi demonstrates himself as a wise man who conquers the fool, and that's Laban. And it just turns out the word fool in Hebrew is the word Nabal, which is Laban's name backwards. I think Nephi, as a very gifted scribe, did that purposely to identify that Laban, as a fool, was one who seeked after um, filthy lucre, didn't care about the word of God, spoke without thinking, and did a lot of other things that he shouldn't have done. All right. So, Zion theology in the Book of Mormon. Do we find David anywhere? Do we see Zion theology, the divine warrior? Let me just show you all the references to David in the entire Old and New Testament. I wasn't going to read all these to you verse by verse. <laughs> but I know some of you guys want to get to church tomorrow. These are all the passages in the Book of Mormon where the name David shows up. I'm going to remove the ones where Nephi is quoting Isaiah. And the last one in Mormon is simply the name of a location. So the only place in the entire Book of Mormon where King David's ever mentioned is by Jacob, the brother of Nephi, and all in the negative. He tells the men who are kings in their own home, do not seek after silver and gold and stop having so many wives. And don't be like David. David is remembered totally in the negative in the, in the Book of Mormon. He's not seen as somebody to emulate at all. Where's Zion theology? Isaiah actually, as a prophet, um, his writings con contain some of the most precise language about Zion theology in the Old Testament. That kind of made me curious. I'm like, wait a second. I get the sense that Nephi is not in Zion theology. Why is he quoting Isaiah? Guess what I discovered? I went through every passage of Isaiah, quoted in the Book of Mormon, and aligned it with Zion theology passages, and only found six verses, all in that large 12-chapter section that Nephi quotes. These are the only six verses that Nephi actually even uses of Zion theology. Look at the rest of the Book of Mormon. 
Here in the red, that's Zion theology in Isaiah. Nobody in the Book of Mormon touches it. Nobody touches Zion theology in, from Isaiah. Nobody touches it. Nobody touches it. They just skip it. They do not touch Zion theology except what I call collateral damage, those 12 chapters where six verses happen to show up. The divine warrior, we actually do get the divine warrior showing up particularly in Jacob, and, but it's mostly absent. And just because you have a sense of God as the all-powerful figure in the universe doesn't mean that that Zion theology is in play where God will just protect his people, no questions asked, which Zion theology tried to convey. Um, so let me get close to the conclusion here, just two more slides. If we think about the covenantal DNA of the Book of Mormon, is it more the conditional covenant of Moses or the unconditional covenant to David? And I've laid out on opposite sides of the screen some of the core features of those two covenants. And what we find, if I put Nephi there, who is probably the chief influencer of Nephi culture, religiously and politically, Nephi wants to be a prophet like Moses, not a king like David. His ancestry comes from the northern kingdom, where these ideas were very popular. Again, it's a very interesting detail that if Joseph Smith is an uneducated 19th century farm kid inventing a book, that he would actually throw in this little tiny detail that Lehi's ancestry is from Manasseh. And then 100 years later, scholars discover that the northern Mosaic, co the covenant of Moses shows up a lot in the northern kingdom. It's just interesting. We find conditional covenants throughout the Book of Mormon. We don't find unconditional covenants. I haven't seen them yet. Nephi rejects kingship because God is a king. Nephi becomes a chief scriptorian. And if you actually look at the greatest leaders in the Book of Mormon, they're always prophets and scripture experts just as the book of Deuteronomy expects, what God expects. Nephi appears to be from the scribal class, not the temple class, and he's a wise man. In conclusion, I believe we must understand the covenant at Sinai if we wish to understand the Book of Mormon. Thank you very much. Do you see a modern parallel between these two patterns? All roads lead to God. We must uh, need to love God and others to be saved. Um, what's actually interesting, I'm not quite sure how to... I don't see Zion theology showing up in uh, Mormon theology. Even the Doctrine and Covenants, I believe, DNC 58 and 59 reinforces this conditional covenant. If you look at it carefully, it's got an introduction. God reviews all the great things he's done for the people. And he lays out the Ten Commandments again. And this is in August of 1831 when um, the early Mormons have first arrived to Missouri, which God has identified as Zion. And here he is, Zion, and God's like, if you want to have peace and prosperity in the land, here's the stipulations. If you don't do it, you'll get kicked out of the land. Um, so if Nephi was trained as a scribe of school, why him? Why not the eldest son of the family? Actually, it's a great question. Why didn't Laman or Lemuel? Um, our best guess is that Laman and Lemuel were probably trained in uh, um, metalworking. Uh, the fact that Nephi is so aware of uh, metals and sword making, um, that their family has a lot of silver and gold, which were not used as uh, monetary coinage, but usually as uh, jewelry and other wealth, that uh, Lehi's family probably were um, metalsmiths. Nephi probably grew up with that, and he's not going to inherit the family business as a, third or for, as a fourth child. But if you're a wealthy family, it's totally legitimate to be sent to school. Let me tell you a quick story about King Asher, um, uh, Asher, Ashurbanipal from Assyria, uh, 680 B.C., um, he's the third son. Um, he's not going to become the king. His older two brothers are more likely to get it. So his dad, who's the emperor of the Assyrian Empire, sends Ashurbanipal to school. And Ashurbanipal becomes very adept at writing, at creating literature, archery, art, music. And his older brother dies unexpectedly. Um, the dad doesn't like the second son and bypasses the second son to make Ashurbanipal the king. The second son gets really mad and a civil war erupts for some years and causes havoc all over the Assyrian Empire. And eventually, uh, Ashurbanipal wins out. And the greatest library of the ancient world was created by the educated son, Ashurbanipal. He created the library in Nineveh that was discovered by in the 1840s, 1850s. So that's typically why, where the youngest son was sent to school if he had wealth. So um, this is pretty common for um, the young men to get that. Can you explain wisdom literature a bit more? Uh, wisdom literature, these are books in the Bible where uh, the focus is on how to be a wise person, a happy, righteous person. And those books include uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Proverbs, and David, what else did I miss? 
Psalms is not, Psalms has some wisdom things, but it's not part of the wisdom tradition. Sorry, I put you on the, all the science shows that when you ask somebody a question, like often, they'll suddenly their mind will go blank. Daniel is a good example. Oh, yeah, Daniel's actually also seen as a wise man, right? Who he's brought into court. Joseph, seen as a wise man. In fact, uh, there's actually some really tantalizing details that Nephi narrates his life a bit in the guise of uh, Joseph of Egypt. Okay. Um, let's see. What are the six parts? Come up to me afterwards. I'll share it with you. If the Sinai covenant was so good, why was the northern kingdom so wicked, worshiping other gods and destroyed, taken away 100 years before the kingdom of David? The whole point is that they actually didn't keep the stipulations. Instead of having God as their king, they kept running after other gods like Baal. And um, that's the point why they fell. They fell because they did not keep the covenant. So this covenant actually puts the responsibility for our unrighteousness back in our own hands. Have you given much thought to the surgery and vassal pattern that might be present in the revelations of DNC? Yes, DNC 58 and 59. And I have an article that I've been trying to write about that too. So any ghostwriters out there or co-authors, let me know. What does Zion theology have to do with um, us? Why should I care? Um, Zion theology doesn't really exist today. It's really only in, in the Bible. It's important to understand because it was a theological and political worldview that dominated Jerusalem for a couple hundred years. And uh, since Lehi's party comes out of Jerusalem, it's un if we want to understand them better, it'd be helpful to understand the world that they came out of. And this was a theology that uh, was quite predominant. Do I get paid for each question? Because I'm trying to go fast here. I think you guys tell them $5 of your question, right? All right. If Laban was wicked, why did many of the words of Jeremiah appear in the brass plates he was responsible for? So um, it turns out that simply owning the record doesn't make you a righteous person. We don't actually know how Laban got a hold of the records. Um, we know that somehow his fathers had had access to it. But apparently he wasn't the kind of man that God was okay having the record because God let him be executed. And I actually personally think one of the reasons why his head got chopped off is what better way to stop the fool from talking is to chop off the head where they can no longer form foolish ideas and speak them. I actually think from a literary standpoint, it's absolutely brilliant. Nephi could have disemboweled him, could have, you know, bled him out. He chopped off the head and the fool needs to have their head taken off because a fool is somebody who speaks foolish things and has foolish thoughts and the head is the source of it. So again, another one for Nephi or the farm boy, Joseph Smith, however you want to say it. Um, higher textual criticism suggests that uh, the reforms under Josiah probably led to tampering with mosaic texts. How does this impact the dichotomy between Mount Zion and Mount Sinai covenant theology? Basically, uh, the Bible has been edited over time, and how can we be completely certain about uh, the fact that these texts have been touched up by lots of different people over time? And the fact is, we don't know exactly, but what I've laid out here seems to have sufficient evidence across the uh, totality of the Bible that you can make these general cases, and I think it makes it pretty clear that the people in the Book of Mormon who are influenced by Nephi, that they want to follow God and his prophet Moses more than they want to be like David. Any final questions? Oh. Could Zenith be compared to pro-Zion? He was zealous for land of inheritance. I would actually say Laman and Lemuel were probably more Zion theology guys. Because think how they said Zion, Jerusalem was righteous. How could this great city fall? That's all Zion theology. And remember the phrase, Nephi says this, woe to those who say all is well in Zion. Why is Nephi saying this? Because he probably heard that phrase shouted all over the uh, city streets of Jerusalem when people were fighting about whether they should trust in Zion or not. Thank you.